Good evening, everyone. Hello, hello. It's wonderful to see all of you. I'm Jacqueline Stewart. I'm director and president of the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures. And thank you so much for being here tonight. This is a very special evening for us. It is an honor to introduce tonight's program celebrating Kathleen Collins' groundbreaking film, Losing Ground, one of the first feature-length motion pictures directed by an African-American woman. Yes! This screening is part of Losing Ground at 40, a two-day multi-site program that brings together luminary black women filmmakers, scholars, and curators to commemorate the 40th anniversary of Kathleen Collins' path-breaking film, to introduce new audiences to Collins' innovative practice, and convene those of us long inspired by it. This event came into being thanks to USC professor A.E. Stevenson, Woo! yes, who happens to be my former student from the Yay! University of Chicago, very proud, and PhD student Adrian Adams. Woo! When they received a faculty grant from Visions and Voices at USC, they put together this project to reflect on Kathleen Collins' legacy. Given Collins' traversal of numerous genres, institutions, and social worlds, it was important to stage this commemoration as a collaboration across numerous venues. Professor Stevenson and Adrian Adams together assembled a roster of black feminist filmmakers and scholars who theorize and create in the wake, to borrow a phrase from Christina Sharp, of Collins. Losing Ground won first prize at the Figueroa International Film Festival in Portugal in 1982, but did not receive an official release until it was restored in 2015, long after director Kathleen Collins passed away from breast cancer in 1988. Losing Ground paved the way for Julie Dash, who was with us tonight. <laughs> to become the first African-American woman to have a wide theatrical release of a feature film with Daughters. Daughters of the Dust in 1991. And the film has traveled in a kind of underground circuit of Collins admirers. I taught it for years from a VHS tape. <laughs> what I shared with my students when I taught Losing Ground is that while the film might not seem to be political, it is truly radical. It reflects aspects of black life and especially black women's lives, that would simply never occur to mainstream filmmakers or even to black male directors. It conveys the interior life of Sarah, her intellect, her fears and self-doubts, her curiosity and creativity, and above all, her triumph in ways that had never been pictured before on screen. I wanna take a moment to acknowledge Tyree Nichols a member of our community that was taken far too soon. Many of us are experiencing sadness, anger, frustration. It really means a lot that you're here with us on this Friday night with me and our esteemed guests to uplift our image, our artistry, and our culture. So thank you truly for being here tonight. We have an exhibition on the fourth floor of the museum called Regeneration, Black Cinema 1898 to 1971. And in so many ways, Kathleen Collins is the actualization of the vision of the pioneering artists that we celebrate in that show. We know that the moving image can move societies viewer by viewer. And I hope that many of you will join us next weekend for the Regeneration Summit, which will convene artists and activists and scholars and many others to reflect on the legacies of black filmmakers. So after the screening, please stick around for a conversation between myself my idol filmmaker, Julie Dash, and Professor A.E. Stevenson. I also want to encourage you to join us tomorrow, January 28th, from 1 to 4 p.m. for more panels and a closing reception at the California African American Museum, when USC is bringing together L.H. Stallings, Zainabu Irene Davis, Falana Payton, Samantha Shepard, Alex Hack, and A.E. Stevenson to think through artistic form, black film genealogy, 
and ecstasy in Colin's work. Before I introduce a very special guest, some housekeeping, please remember that we want to focus on the sounds and images on screen. So silence your cell phones and please remember that there's no eating in the theater. We're recording this event tonight with professional videographers and photographers, so we please ask you to refrain from recording images for yourself, because ours are going to look so good, and will be on our YouTube site soon. And now it is my honor to introduce Nina Lorez Collins, daughter of the late Kathleen Collins. <laughs> Nina. Nina rescued the original negative of Losing Ground and restored the film in 2015. In addition to serving as the manager of her mother's estate, she is the chief creative officer of Revel and founder of Wolfer. She published What Would Virginia Woolf Do in 2018 with Grand Central Publishing, and she's the board chair of the Brooklyn Public Library. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Nina Collins. everyone, thank you. Um, this event has been made possible by the collaboration of the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures, USC Visions and Voices, the California African American Museum, the USC Gender and Sexuality Studies Department, and the financial support of USC Visions and Voices, which opened up the opportunity to invite this fantastic lineup of black women artists and scholars. We're incredibly thankful for the co-sponsorship of USC's Center for Feminist Research, the Africana Research Cluster, and the Consortium for Gender, Sexuality, Race, and Popular Culture. We'll highlight other people we'd like to thank during tomorrow's event, but for now I'd like to acknowledge the labor of a few people. Eduardo Sanchez, the manager of public programs at the Academy Museum, who shepherded Adrian and AE's initial event pitch up the museum's chain of command. Andrea Lust and Amelia Boyk for their labor as the sign language interpreters for both today and tomorrow's events. And the Academy staff, theater ops, talent coordination, and film programs for hosting this event in the Ted Mann Theater. So thank you all. Um, I'd like to here offer a little context about my mother, Kathleen Collins, to understand the movie you're about to watch. She was born in 1942 in Jersey City, New Jersey. Her father was a funeral home director who went on to become a middle school principal. Her mother died when Kathleen was only five months old, and my mother was raised by a very loving, quite religious stepmother. Her parents were traditional and conservative. They expected her to become a teacher and a wife. When my mother left for Skidmore College at 17, where she went on to become the first black graduate, my grandfather caused a little bit of a stink by insisting to the administration that she be given a single room. So worried were they about what she was getting into. Um, but my mother thrived at Skidmore, and that's where she became a writer for the school paper and an activist. She got involved with SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, um, worked in Georgia on voter registration in the early 60s, and eventually went on to get a master's degree at the Sorbonne in Paris, where she studied film, religion, and philosophy, evidence of which you'll see in the movie. Um, then it was back to New York City, where she fell in love with film editing, and that was her portal into the world that became her career. She married and divorced a fellow artist, had a couple kids, and was fascinated by all things occult. Um, so I thought I'd give you just a little background. I hope that gives you a sense of who she was. Fast forward a few decades, and my mother died of breast cancer in 1988, when she was 46 years old. My brother and I were teenagers, and she had raised us alone in a house along the Hudson River, about 40 miles north of New York City. Um, the bulk of her work, her two independent films, over a dozen plays and screenplays, a collection of literary short stories, were all written in that house when she was in her 30s, a black woman raising two small kids alone on a salary from her full-time job as a film professor at New York City College. Her work, all these years later, is distinctive for many things. Her humor, the intellectual flair, the raw sexuality, 
But mostly, I think, for the still very unusual, hardly ever seen way she handles the interior life of a young black woman, separate from the overt politics of race. We don't see these women's, women's stories nearly enough in books or film, but I do think we're starting to. And I think the reason her work resonates so much now more than ever before is that people are ready or close to ready for what she was heralding all those many years ago. When Losing Ground was first shown to audiences in 1982, a white film distributor actually said to my mother about her characters, these aren't real black people. But of course they are. In fact, they're her. All of her work is deeply autobiographical, so much so that still, every time I see or read her, I'm brought back to our kitchen table in the 70s, to the friends and family, students, ex-husband, and lovers who streamed in and out of our house. She was writing about herself and her own preoccupations, which in many ways are universal. How can we be seen? What is our value? What does love mean? At the time of her death, my mother was certainly somewhat known in black creative circles, particularly as a playwright who'd had a few works produced. But her writing had barely ever been published, save snippets here and there, and her films never distributed. For over 20 years after her death, her work lay dormant, tucked away in an old steamer trunk in my basement, ignored because A, I didn't really think anyone would care, and B, because it was too painful for me to sift through and try to understand. When I was ready, myself at that point, a mother in my late 30s, I went to the trunk looking for answers about my own childhood and history, and I found work that moved me to my core. It took almost another 10 years but now her films, Losing Ground, and its predecessor, The Cruz Brothers and Miss Malloy, and her two books, the story collection, Whatever Happened to Interracial Love, and a collection of a bunch of her work called Notes from a Black Woman's Diary, are all out in the world, getting the attention they deserve, and more importantly, helping to fill a void that is desperately felt. It's heartbreaking to imagine all the brilliant black women's voices that we've surely lost throughout history women who wrote and imagined and expressed themselves and whose vision was either never recorded or never preserved. So this film, Losing Ground, on the 40th anniversary of my mother struggling to get it made, and it was really a struggle, is an important piece of history. And you'll be amazed to see how it holds up, how fresh it feels, and how still unusual it is to see characters like this grace the screen. So enjoy, and thank you. All right, this is on. Hello, everyone. How are y'all doing? I can't really see, but I'm acting like I can. Um, hi, what a wonderful, wonderful occasion um, to start our first day of Losing Ground at 40. I'm so honored to be here with my former professor, Professor Stewart, <laughs> and obviously the legendary Julie Dash. <laughs> um, so what we're gonna do, we have about 45 minutes for Q&A, so we're gonna have talk a conversation for a little bit and then we'll open it up for the audience members. Um, to get started though, how many people were seeing this for the first time? Yeah, so many people, wow. Wow, okay, well I have a similar question for the two of y'all, which was how, when was the first time you remember seeing this film? Do you remember where? I've seen it many times, and I think the first time I think was um, like 19 in the 80s, early 80s, and I'm thinking that was perhaps with um, an event at the Indiana, Indiana um, Black Center Archives with Phyllis Klotman. She would have us there. She was a huge supporter of indie filmmakers, black indie filmmakers, and, uh, and I think it was probably there that I first saw it and everyone was just spellbound and stunned it was because it, this is this film is magnificent. <laughs> yeah. It's absolutely wonderful, I guess. What about you? Uh, I think I saw it as an undergrad. Uh, I went to Stanford and I was uh, a research assistant for a black film class. And I had to go through and try to find up to that point all the scholarship and all the, you know, and I read about the film and that's where I got my 
bootleg VHS tape <laughs> of Losing Ground. Yes, yes, we love a pirated film. <laughs> um, my first time seeing this film was actually my first year of grad school, if, if I'm remembering correctly. I remember being really taken aback um, at UCLA in 2016, um, maybe 2017 actually, winter quarter, with Professor Ellen Scott, who is part of the Academy, also UCLA affiliated. Um, so it was wild. I remember watching the movie and being like, is that me? <laughs> I'm like, is that me? And it's like the mannerisms, everything. It seemed like so contemporary um, in such a way that really, even still, kind of the questions, the concerns, the pursuits of everything still stands really out of, out of time, really, in many ways. I'm gonna open my little book here, get our questions, all right. Yeah, and our answers. <laughs> all right, so one of, speaking of, you know, given that we are all professors, um, what does the demonstration of Sarah's pedagogy at the beginning of the film mean for each of you in terms of how it opens up kind of thinking about her as in, in ecstasy? Like she is in a moment in that film and she's questioning her own desire for ecstasy and where she can find it. But I feel like when the film opens, we witness her yeah. in a moment. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering what you think of that opening scene. That's the scene that blew my mind because I knew I wanted to go to grad school, I wanted to be a professor. And then she was doing it. Like people talk about how important it is to see a reflection of yourself on screen. And I think they sometimes mean that in general terms, but to see that specificity just completely blew me away. I'm sure I filed it in my mind and it helped me imagine the actual possibility of being a professor. And then uh, when I was teaching the film, I remember a few times when some of my students who didn't look like me um, had a problem with her pedagogy, actually. Like they were like, you know, she sounds really stiff and kind of questioning the, the content of her lecture. And that pissed me off. <laughs> um, because what I love is exactly what you're, you're capturing is that she gets in a zone and I've had that experience in teaching and she just clearly loves what she's doing and she's playful in that moment because you see how uh, more formal and stiff and cautious she is when she gets home. Mm -hmm. But when she's in the space of her pedagogy, she has feels a sense of freedom. Mm -hmm. It's really amazing. There's never been a representation like that before or since of like black women intellectuals being black women intellectuals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very powerful. Well, I was a graduate student when I first saw this. I was at UCLA at the time. And this Sarah was a character that, well, I knew. Mm -hmm. uh, I, was, I had the pleasure and privilege and opportunity to meet um, Kathleen Collins uh, early on in the early 70s. And so let me just back up and say, when I met her, I was a... a an intern at Chamba Productions in uh, New York City. And Kathleen was there. She was an editor. And uh, I know that she was a re recent graduate of the Sorbonne. That she was fluent in French. Mm -hmm. She had babies. Mm -hmm. I used to go into the editing room and hold her little son for her sometimes while she was editing. And she was that person. She was brilliant. She was articulate. Um, but at the time I didn't know that she was so talented as a filmmaker. And so fast forward back to UCLA, we were filmmakers and I don't think we had the courage to create characters like the Sarah character. I mean, we, we knew people like that. We, but we didn't have the courage because we felt we were operating within the confines of doing uh, black films that, that that we thought were the black films that we were supposed to be making at the time. So that character was went beyond the confines of the restricted world that we were working in at the time, you know, just doing films for our community, to showing black women in a different way, women of the African diaspora in a different way, to redefining them. But I don't think we had the we had the education, but we didn't have 
perhaps the, the curiosity or the nerve to go that far. And so when we saw um, uh, this film for the first time, all of us, everyone was like, whoa. <laughs> We're taking a back. It was like, oh, we have to step it up because this is something that we know these people. We know her. We know him. Why aren't we showing this? Why aren't we going that far? So I hope I answered the question. No, that was a wonderful answer because I'm thinking also of your film that you made while you were a student at UCLA, Illusions, which was your student film to graduate, which, you know, within this film, they're making a student film for the graduation, right? <laughs> um, and we were saying backstage, we were like, I wish that movie actually existed. <laughs> I want to see what it actually looks like. Um, but I think all the time about watching Illusions, and Professor Stewart showed me Illusions for the first time in um, her class, African American Cinema, since the 1970s. And also that character, Mignon. I got a little pushback on that when I was making Re it. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Would you like to share? <laughs> I'd love to know. Maybe Brock. Maybe like okay. <laughs> but I think I think about that character also has a very the final line she delivers. She's like, you know, you can't underestimate the power of that screen. Mm -hmm. Um, and a similar kind of declaration of like self and like the intention behind artistic making as world making. Mm -hmm. And when I was researching this film, I was like, okay, so it's the black lady philosophy professor you know at the time there were no black women who had philosophy degrees in the united states angela davis angela davis yes international uh, she, uh yeah she was um what do you call it a continental philosopher and she was you know had all these boys and she was uh, all of that having studied uh with the um with german school or the Mark frankfurt yeah. frankfurt school of uh, german philosophy right yeah she was she was that person Right. And the first person to get the first black woman to get a Ph.D. in philosophy, I believe, was Adrian Piper, the performance artist. Mm, wow. So years after this movie actually came out. So I'm still amazed, like in terms of how she con it was herself. We talked. Nina also mentioned how it was herself and also others that she knew and similar to how you knew about this. But it, it still seems like a kind of entry into developing a world that still has not been taken into another room in that world, mm -hmm. another state in that world. You know, I continue to think about this. When, I guess asking, you know, if you teach this film, mm -hmm. how do you place it um, in the course? What elements do you think of um, as being instructive for the course? Um, what parts do you point students to well, well I, I, te that to I teach production so we're gonna no, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm still reeling about what you said thinking about this film in relation to your work and the other uh, women of the LA rebellion in particular because the film illusions which you all should see <laughs> the final speech this woman is in Hollywood she's passing for white mm -hmm. and she articulates the importance of making films and I've asked you before, like, isn't that just you say, giving your philosophy of making films? And you always say, no. But, and, and so. But I knew her. I you knew her, yes. And it's set in the 40s. It's yeah. um, during World War II. Yeah. But you create a distance, like a historical distance. It was also the time, the height of making propaganda films coming out of the United States. So yes. it was perfect for, yes. for that, you know. So, so the kind of, um, I don't know, the bravery Mm -hmm. <laughs> that Kathleen Collins demonstrates and really like almost directly reflecting herself to get back to what Nina was saying. Mm -hmm. That's so powerful. Cause I can't, I, I don't necessarily think of your work as explicitly autobiographical or work of the other LA rebellion filmmakers as being that deeply pers or explicitly personal. So that just gave me a whole new appreciation for what she's doing. I, I can understand that, but to get to your question, mm -hmm. um, you know, I would teach the film, it felt like if it fit into a gap, the same gap that Illusions fills in terms of the late 1970s and early 1980s. Mm -hmm. um, because when I would teach like surveys of black film, you have the independent race movie movement of the 19 teens to the 40s, then it seems like nothing happens, mm -hmm. but that's mm -hmm. not true. And then a kind of rise up again, in the late 60s, 70s, and then it seems like a quicker drop <laughs> And then the 80s, and that's when I kind of was starting to learn about the L.A. Rebellion and then mm -hmm. Spike Lee, where many people think black film history begins. But. 
<laughs> go see regeneration and you'll see that that's not true. So it, for me, it fit this gap sort of um, post black exploitation, pre Spike Lee. So there was that. Yeah. Yeah. And then trying to figure out how to articulate a tradition of black women's filmmaking. Mm -hmm. And so going very early, we know Zora Neale Hurston shot footage. Right. Alois Gist and her husband made these uh, religious films. Mm -hmm. Hellbound train. Amazing Hellbound train that they would play in churches. and um, But really difficult to find that lineage mm -hmm. of black women's participation in, in filmmaking. So it was just really important to find what you can in order to demonstrate at least like later on that there were women who were just making, like Julie, making extraordinary work. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is one of the reasons why I love Cheryl Dunier's film, The Watermelon Woman, mm -hmm. because she demonstrates the importance of even just like the act of pretending to create your own history just so that maybe something authentic will come out of that. Mm -hmm. Well, I just have to say that um, if it wasn't for Kathleen Collins, I mean, I'm ready. When I first met her, I was like the intern at Chamber and she was definitely the role model. She was, she was everything that we all wanted to be as filmmakers. Um, of course, she had she hadn't made um, this film or the Cruz Brothers yet, but she was um, she was just brilliant. And um, and then after I saw this, I, w I got to brag, <laughs> brag and rice. I, I worked with her. I worked with her. You know. The, so, man, she was she was someone to uh, really look up to. And um, every time I see this film, it just I'm over impressed once again because of the so many layers so many layers to it that uh, of understanding and filmmaking you know with the you know with the film scenes I, I still don't get the little guy with the monocle but with his photo viewfinder but I just I think it's really cute <laughs> you know, it's like it's like nice and also the way she um uh her aesthetics the way she um composed her frames um she didn't rely upon traditional you know, wide angle, over the shoulder, medium shot, close up. She did what she wanted to do. Um, she didn't bother to follow the rules of uh, agreement of shots, of owing a shot. Like when she was holding on Sarah at certain times, she didn't cut back to get the reaction to the mother or to her husband. She just, you know, it was it was Sarah's moment. So, uh, and, th and that takes courage. You know, because you'll have people say, well, you know, you have to cut back, you know, you, you owe that shot. So uh, she was very, um, she knew what she wanted to do. Uh, she knew her aesthetics and it was just, everything was just, it worked out. The drama and the tension, it, it just worked out perfectly. Wow, thank you so much. Um, thinking also, I did write a note about the monocle and I did want to ask. <laughs> In terms of like, you know, I think it's, Seeing again fresh, I'm, gra I'm glad to see like when she enters into the film scene um, and he pans over with the monocle to her and then the monocle kind of drops and he runs out. Like how did she yeah. even film that? But the monocle means so many different things. Right. She's under the spotlight, under the mi microscope. She <laughs> Maybe he couldn't afford a viewfinder. I don't know. <laughs> but it, it's just, it, it was just a perfect way of framing her, of putting a spotlight on her, shining a light on her. Now, it's your moment now. You know, it's your moment to shine. Well, she was already shining, but for her to know it was her moment to shine. So the monocle meant so many different things to me. Well, we're kind of already talking about it, but I'm wondering also, what are your, some of y'all's favorite shots from this film? <laughs> There's so many. So um, many. Well, like I was saying earlier, with the um, when isolating um, Sarah, when she's sitting at the dining room table with her mother and her husband, and they're talking and just holding on her, uh, the Kahinde Wally shot mm -hmm. <laughs> with Celia in the garden. Yeah, it looks like it was like President oh, Obama's Kahinde. photo yeah. painting that Kahinde yeah, Wally. Yeah, it was did. like oh, Kahinde yeah. Wally. Yeah. And it was like, so there were so many um, in there that it was just um, it's it, it's like delightful. You know, mm -hmm. you know, it was, it was, I like her aesthetics. <laughs> and there's that shot too, after her office hours, yeah. the yeah. hundreds of hours of office hours, yeah. <laughs> I totally relate to that yeah. moment, yeah. student mm -hmm. after student. And then when it's done and she's sitting there and it's this incredible painting mm -hmm. with the mm -hmm. orange behind her and the, in this kind of whatever, is it paint? Is it light yeah. coming through? Mm -hmm. 
and um, her just kind of sitting with this odd feeling of, you know, working, but also contemplating her, her life and her marriage and what people see in her. Mm -hmm. It's just incredible. It's an incredible shot. Mm -hmm. I said this at dinner, but I am on the hunt for that shirt. Uh, I will get that you, high neck. You kind of have it. I will have to get the high neck shirt. It is imperative for my professorly wardrobe that I have it. <laughs> you're doing okay. I Thank think you. you're doing all right. Thank you. Um, one of the questions, we kind of already touched on this as well. So I'm thinking, you know, in Dars the Dust, um, you worked famously with painter Carrie James Marshall for cinematography of your film. And so I'm wondering, in production, this- Production design. Pro production design, yeah, apologies. AJ did the cinematography, yeah. I was wondering if you could say more, if you have anything to say about the kind of conversations in this film between filmmaking and painterly expression um, and how also that may have appeared in your work also. Well, I think um, Jacqueline al already mentioned it with that scene, with uh, that moment, the composition of the frame of her sitting in this, um, almost like an altar is around her and the lighting and the, how she's dressed and the, p the color of the room and all that. So, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> that. I could say it was great working with Carrie. I learned a lot from him. Yeah. Um, but um, I don't know. I'm, I'm not quite sure how to answer that question, how to respond to it. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. do you have any questions for me? <laughs> yeah, could you answer that one for me? I, <laughs> I'll answer that one for you. It's one of, the, one of the questions with the answers. But, you know, it doesn't exactly answer your question. But him being a painter, mm -hmm. I think, is very interesting. Right. Mm -hmm. Because it then adds his work and other paintings kind of become part of the set design of the mm, film. Yeah. And uh, then it just immerses you in this feeling of, oh, black people make art, mm -hmm. including the black person who made the film mm -hmm. that you're watching. Mm -hmm. So I think it reinforces that. Mm -hmm. And then it's just amazing to me the way that this film uh, explores um, what it's like to love and live with an artist. Oh, yeah. I mean, the way that she um, kind of gauges what he says. Yeah, she's like s searching for to, to define aesthetic seizure, mm -hmm. and he is in a state of ecstasy, ecstasy mm -hmm. all the time. Right. right. <laughs> you know, so it's like, whoa. You know. So, right. Yeah. She tr she's in kind of trying to understand him. Mm -hmm. She has a kind, there's a, an envy there. Mm -hmm that she can't express it in the same way because of gender, but also because of their art forms. Cause she says, if I acted, if I wrote, then would you have, mm -hmm. you know, respect for me? I guess like whatever creative writing, mm -hmm. but the way that she keeps reading him, like uh, every word that he says, cause she knows mm, in two weeks that leads to something crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's just amazing the way that it captures the, I don't know, like the patience and the, how, how to support someone who's an artist, how to, uh, and, and the kind of, so I'm gonna offend every artist in here when I say this, but like the vanity, mm -hmm. the conceit, artistic that's conceit. sort of necessary yeah. mm -hmm. in order to really hone in on your creative practice. Mm -hmm. And so toward the end, when she is really breaking down because she's always had to be the rational one, the reliable one for her mother, who admits that too, mm -hmm. you know, finally becomes too much. So to think about how just opening up some kind of space to be creative or to be wild, to be unpredictable, mm -hmm. um, that that's a hard thing to do. It's really just so powerful the way the film captures that. Mm -hmm. And it made him unstable. He couldn't he handle, handle it. it. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 <laughs> Man. All right, well, we have time for questions from the audience. If there are any people who have any questions for any of us up here about the film or anything. I know we got some scholars, some, some artists in here. So, yes. for the recording. Um, someone in the audience said thank you for this and hopefully there'll be more and thank you, thank you for coming and I'm glad that you got to experience the film in this room. It was so, we were talking about how we, I've never seen this with this larger audience, like people laughing. I was like, is that funny? <laughs> I, I was like, well normally, you know, I'm watching it somewhere I'm like, I'm like, 
in the back. So I was like, oh, oh, that is a, that is a joke. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Right. Well, um, hmm. Okay. Crash it. Can I, can I repeat the question <laughs> before? Yeah. Um, you're asking a question in terms of what uh, Miss Dash said earlier about watching these films and trying to, in real time, make a new lineage of films that maybe not the films that they wanted to make, but what they felt they had to make. And how did they navigate that? Okay, so it's like every generation has a voice, has has a task. As an artist, you have tasks that, or challenges that you want to uh, bring to life in terms of your artwork or, or your film or what have you. So we had certain things that we wanted to address while we were at, uh, let's say, UCLA, and um, which is a West Coast thing. Here we are in LA West Coast. Kathleen was East Coast. <laughs> and... So the voices were the same, but they were different. Um, this was a more mature, bolder voice with a vision that was perhaps more courageous than ours. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, so yeah. Um, and that's what I'm feeling now, looking back at it. Um, so uh, and so today, um, it's it's not the same, you know. I teach film production at Spelman, and I I have to go like, whoa, when my students come and tell me, well, they're gonna do this and they're gonna do that, I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know, it's like uh, I can't. I have to encourage them to do their best, to have an use their authentic voice, and always to be courageous, go as step beyond what you think is the safety zone. Um, Kathleen did that with this film. Um, within the, I have to say, the silo of UCLA's <laughs> LA Rebellion, I don't think this would have been possible at the time for us to do, because we were more <laughs> like deadhead, like, you know, you, you, you know, how does it save the people type of thing. Everything was like, <laughs> You know, this was the uh, late 70s, early 80s. So, um, yeah. I see. Okay. I'm going to go this way. I'm going to go like one, two, three. All right. I'm going to bring this to you, actually. The G student, and um, as I was watching the film, I noticed it felt like it had kind of like an ethnographic tone to it. Mm -hmm. um, and I was really interested in the way that Sorette's like character is framed in kind of this dichotomy to the Puerto Rican women. Um, and I'm kind of interested in the way that femininity, femininity and like licentiousness and ecstasy is kind of expected from this Latinx like yeah. femme woman. Mm -hmm. And then of course it's like being pulled out of our main character because that's like kind of the the thesis of the film. And I'm wondering like, what do you think, or like, what are your thoughts on that dichotomy and, and what ways might it reaffirm some of our ideas about what Latinx women are supposed to be? Um, even though they're kind of challenged in the end with her like moral convictions about the husband and stuff, um, I still wonder like, is that thing at the end kind of enough to like, you know, problematize what's been happening throughout the film? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, great, great question. Yeah. I don't know if I, I can. you know, for the first time watching it on the biggest screen I've ever seen it on. Mm -hmm. um, when he's first walking through the neighborhood and you get the music, mm -hmm. it it hit me harder than ever that oh, this is his projection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, because like the dialogue doesn't make sense. It's kind of like part of the music, but. Mm -hmm. Or, or the voices, the women's voices that you hear, it's almost like nonsensical. So that made me think differently about exactly what you're raising. And those are the moments, too, that felt like the most 
like quasi ethnographic because he's looking for, you know, like Gauguin or something, like some primitive people, <laughs> women to paint. Um, but then I, we have to also look at the way that she's represented when she's interacting with him in the house and the man, you know, it adds like man, <laughs> like that part, I, I can't, I don't have it. <laughs> That's no comment on that part. <laughs> it goes along with what, it's in many ways with what you're saying, but then talking now, um, not only does he have his ethnographic, you know, um, primitivist mm -hmm. view, uh, she also is, she's jealous, and, and she is, um, you know, just really, she's comparing herself. He's, he brought her in to be the antithesis of this yeah. cold-faced wife that he has. And so they're both kind of, she's like a projection. I think she's presented as a projection from both of their points of view mm -hmm. in a way that um, is not unproblematic, but I mm -hmm. think it's supposed to be providing some insight into their the tensions that they have within themselves and then between each other. That's the way mm -hmm. that really came across for me more watching it this time. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Who was the next? It was one, two, three. Oh, okay, cool. And there was someone in the middle here. All right. I'm a, I see. So sorry to see. Yes, please. But, um, but also the kind of contemplations about black artists and black identity in that kind of mid-70s, early 80s period. That's happening, I think, to kind of say what Julie's saying in a different way on the West Coast than it is on the East Coast. I didn't know. If you well, that was his home, Bill Gunn's home, that they used the location for, for this show. So that helped. It's a beautiful location. <laughs> um, I'll repeat the question in terms of like what was going on in New York at the time um, and has this resonance of these other two films, Symbio Psycho, Symbio, Symbio Psycho, Taxoplasm, Take One. Take One, yes. Not forget. And uh, Ganjan Hess. And also, you know, Bill Gunn is in Ganjan Hess, Oz is, as is Dwayne Jones, who plays Victor. Victor plays Bill Gunn. Duke played by Dwayne Jones, yes. So they're in the same movie as well. They have a similar going up to the East, going up to upstate to this palatial home and kind of just messing around, theorizing and such, um, and seeing what comes out <laughs> in different ways, of course. Theme in her work that comes up a lot. Nina, the idea of the country home occurs in her mother's work, all of her works throughout. So it's not necessarily just the, also the filming world, but also within her own world. It's an idea. Do we have any more questions? We may have like one or two more minutes. Yes. Someone asked about uh, Kathleen Collins' interest in the occult um, and how that came to be and such. <laughs> Years right before she died, she got very involved in this. Um... Hey, hold on, Nina. Hold on. <laughs> Uh, she got very, well, she was psychic. She used to give psychic readings. <laughs> and, um, but it was always, uh, you know, like I had uh, astrological readings as like a 12 year old. And um, she, um, uh, so, and right the years before she died, she got very interested in this Kabbal Kabbalistic 
kind of cult called Builders of the Adidum, which is, was based in L.A. Um, so I would just say it was a lifelong interest. So the psychic scene was very familiar to me from my childhood because she was always going to psychics and sending me to psychics. And, um, you know, we had like dream catchers and she was always doing like biofeedback and yoga. And so all of that was just who she was, uh, where it came from. I don't know. I mean, she grew up religious and she's, you know, she was grew up pres Presbyterian and she studied religion in college. But obviously at some point she kind of diverged into an interest in all things occult. I can't really answer it better than that. But she did have a period where she gave psychic readings for a few years and then she stopped because she got cancer and she said it was too draining on her body. Yeah. Okay. And, and also just to the question about the country also as, um, as I think Julie said, but Bill Gunn lived in Rockland County and we also lived in Rockland County. So it was shot in Rockland County outside of New York and Havistraw. Um, so yeah, they were neighbors, Bill Gunn and Sam Wayman, his lover, were, they lived a few miles from us and they were all close friends and it was shot up there. Thank you so much. One other question right here. And also, Verda Mae Grobner used to live up there with them. She used to cook for Sam and uh, Wyman. I'm working on uh, travel notes of a Geechee girl, and so she spent quite a few years up there with them. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Do we have any more questions? One person here. Yes, there was a question thinking about the kind of dichotomy and that's represented in the film between um, film practitioners and then academic scholars and how one is kind of like degraded and then one is other kind of vaulted. Um, and what do we, how do we feel about that? Well, I know for a fact back then film was not trending. <laughs> and so, so they, they, you know, film schools are, you know, overcrowded now. Mm -hmm. Uh I, would, I graduated, went out to Los Angeles and walked right into AFI. There was no one waiting to get in. And then from there, I went to UCLA and just walked. There was no one <laughs> waiting to get in. So uh, the, the scenes, I love the scenes that she has with the, the guys on, you know, shooting um, actually on, on the campus of City College. Uh, when I first saw the film um, and, you know, back in, in the early 80s, a lot of people didn't get it. I noticed today, tonight, everyone was like kind of laughing when he was saying, okay, pan, pan, pan. It's like, oh my God, the Maison scene. <laughs> people did not react years ago because they didn't know the jargon. They didn't understand exactly what was happening at all times, at all screenings. So it's interesting now that it's just like she was like way ahead of her time, yeah. Oh, just it seems like to me since the amazing Kathleen Collins studied French film, as I understand it, and literature, that she was both, you know, right brained and left brained when it came to cinema. She appreciated the aesthetics and the history, and then she also made films. And this film, really beautifully to me, kind of like um, bridges that gap so that her interest in being a part of the filmmaking process is a way that she's kind of bringing her intellectual interests together with her like creative impulses. So it would be great if a lot of film schools could somehow figure out a way to bridge that because it, it seems like this is almost like a blueprint for why there should be mutual respect 
across those two, you know, customarily divergent ways of thinking about film, studying film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that at UCLA now, it's like you have to take a certain number of like critical courses if you're a production student, mm -hmm. but the critical students are not required to take any production classes. Uh -huh. Um, as part of our degree. <laughs> so it is interesting still to kind of like get in here and like learn stuff, but then we don't get out there to do things. So it is interesting that it still maintains today. Mm -hmm. We good on time? Mm -hmm. All right. We have any questions? Oh, someone in the back. Oh, Adrian, I will come up. I want to come deliver this mic for you, honestly. <laughs> Adrian worked so hard putting together this event with me, so I want to make sure. <laughs> okay, I want uh, I want to know from you all. We've talked about genealogies of Black women filmmakers and artists, folks on the rise, folks since um, Kathleen Collins that really just leave no crumbs for you. No crumbs. <laughs> me, sorry. Okay. <laughs> That, that inspire you, that give you creative energy, that really fuel your sense of curiosity. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Gina no cry for you. That was too deep. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, Gina Prince Blythewood for me with um, Woman King and, uh, of course, Ava DuVernay, girlfriend, and uh, Cheryl Dunye. Oh, my gosh, yes. And uh, Nima Barnett and Ioka Chinzera. Um, Sally Richardson. Yeah, yeah Sally Richardson. Oh, there are just so many now. So it's, it's wonderful. You just like, <laughs> and everyone has a different style, a different story to tell, a different voice, a different authenticity. Um, so it's great. It's great. Such a good time to be able to witness and connect all the genealogies across time. And it's really wonderful for me to be able to sit here with the two of you, because while I'm meeting you for the first time, Miss Dash, oh. um, <laughs> you both are so very important to me in terms of the kind of scholar that I wish to be. Um, and so it's really an honor to be able to sit here in front of these other people and talk about you know the impact that you both had in terms of me understanding what film can be. And then also thinking about sisterhood and scholarship. So uh, what a wonderful night. I'm so grateful to be able to do this with the two of you. Um, and I look forward to being able to continue this tomorrow um, for those who are going to join us at the California African American Museum. Um, from one until four, I'll be in conversation with other scholars. I know most of them are here. I saw them, <laughs> some of them in the back. Um, and continue to discuss the work that we did not get to touch upon today. Okay. So, yes. Thank, Thank you, you and everyone for putting this together. Out.